All right. Uh, everybody can hear my mic okay? So I guess we're good to go. Uh, my name is Tom Boone. I'm a reference librarian at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Um, I also do some web development, both on the side, outside of work, and related to some of the projects we have uh, going on at Loyola now. I also wanted to introduce someone who's not on the schedule for this uh, program, which is Pam Brannon from Georgia State. Uh, she's here sort of as I sort of I told her that she that she's to be less active than Scalia, but more active than Clarence Thomas. Um, I basically wanted I, I, I'm sort of working sort of free form and I wanted to have someone here who was guaranteed to be asking questions a little more aggressively than what it, uh, than what you guys might be doing. And also, because I'll have some questions, and I wanted to be guaranteed if nobody else showed up, that uh, there was somebody that would be able to give me feedback on some things. Um, so uh, what I'm talking about today is uh, sort of working with developing faculty scholarship. And there's other sessions going on uh, to, today and through the rest of the conference uh, related to librarians doing work with faculty on developing scholarship. But this one is not so much about sort of, you know, re their research needs uh, or helping generate ideas per se. This one is more about providing sort of a, uh, an infrastructure for them to be able to get feedback from other people on the faculty easily uh, on those ideas that they're working on, even at sort of a quarter baked or, uh, you know, 16th baked or whatever uh, sort of level where from the very beginning they can start uh, working with other people, even very small groups of people uh, of their choosing to develop those things without needing to necessarily be in the same room or have a workshopping event uh, going on. So uh, at Loyola, the way that uh, this happens, and I think this is the way it happens at a lot of law schools, is they'll have sort of workshop events. Uh, some places will call them half-baked talks. Some of them will call them, you know, uh, lunch and learn or brown bag or whatever. And the idea is that one of the faculty members who is working on an article uh, in an early stage uh, will come in and do maybe a PowerPoint slideshow or just sort of talk through the idea or talk through the draft stage of what they've uh, developed so far. And, uh, and then they might talk for a half hour, 45 minutes, and then they open it up to the rest of the faculty who are there at the program, and those faculty will uh, appropriately just sort of rip into that idea, uh, both to provide them with ideas of how to develop it further, um, or also to tell them what they're completely off the mark about so that they don't write something that steers into a wrong direction. So they have people there to sort of play devil's advocate and point them in a better direction. And you may get two faculty members who are, who are arguing strenuously in two opposite directions, and then it's up to the, uh, the author to actually decide which way they want to go with, with it. Um, one of the problems with this as sort of a primary method of workshopping or developing uh, these ideas is that there's very few slots over the course of the year for the faculty to be able to do this. So I've got pulled up on the screen here what uh, our law school has uh, for the schedule for the summer um, of the faculty workshops. And so over the course of the entire summer, we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slots. One of those, the one that's going to be happening in 45 minutes, about a half hour from now, is someone who is actually not even a law school faculty. It's someone from our parent university who works in the political science department but works on a lot of legal ideas, and they've invited him. So that's one less slot that's available to our faculty to workshop these things at these official workshop events. And then if I go back to the past workshop schedules and say look at the spring schedule, the vast majority of who's coming in and doing these talks are not our faculty members. They are uh, people from other law schools uh, or, you know, in the case of Gregory, Boy, Gr Gr Gregory Boyle, he's not even uh, a fa law faculty at all. He's a local community leader who's coming in to talk about something. So uh, we do have one of our faculty listed there, and that's the only member of our faculty who did one of these talks during our spring semester. So like I said, there's just not that much opportunity for them to develop these things. Obviously, there's other ways for them to develop these ideas. Uh, but with this idea in mind of wanting to give them more opportunities and to not restrict them to just when there is a slot available in this regularly scheduled program, I wanted to give them something 
that provides them sort of um, nonlinear ability to workshop these things so that they can post these things where everyone can get to them uh, or whoever they want to get to them can get to them. And uh, then receive feedback in that same sort of nonlinear way where it's not required that they be in a room during the same hour but still be able to develop these ideas and get sort of the back and forth uh, as, as allowed. So what I've created is this, uh, what I've called uh, the online um, faculty scholarship workshop, the faculty workshop, whatever. This is the front page of what I've got so far, uh, which, and if I switch to a different browser where I'm logged in with a different username, you actually see different content on the page. Uh, so I want to, before I go into sort of a tour of this site and then get a little more deeper into how it works, I just wanted to take, an up, take a second to sort of get an idea of what everyone here has been dealing with. So the first question I have sort of from an audience perspective is how many of you are librarians? All right. Uh, how many are faculty? All right, and how many are IT? Okay, so Christina is our one IT. Um, all right, well then, uh, not that I'm insulting your intelligence, but I will keep the you know, uh, programming code to a minimum since we're not IT people in this room. Um, so the next question I have then is I'm curious, and I'll start with Pam since I've put her on the hot seat. Um, how do your faculty develop uh, ideas in-house. If you could push the, get the microphone. Push to talk? Yeah. Well, basically what our faculty do is, um, one thing is we are lucky that they're basically all on the same floor. So they walk around uh, to each other's offices uh, to develop at the very early stages. And then they just share it via email, and then eventually, once they get to uh, pre-wanting to post it on SSRN stage, um, we have a brown bag series that's similar to the series that you're talking about, where they will give a presentation and then, um, and then you know, get basically torn apart by all the other faculty, but in an extraordinarily nice way, because we have nice faculty. Um, but basically, that's the process. Okay. Uh, is uh, anybody here have any alternatives to that that they could share with us of how this takes place at your law school? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Could you push the? Could you get the mic on for the people at home? Um, this is Chris Nadering, who's at Cleveland State University. We a couple of years ago, the faculty, it's voluntary, but we started scholarship support groups, um, which always strikes me as a funny name because it sounds like we need therapy. But um, it's a small group, and people broke up by topic area of interest and some of the groups work better than others um, the group I'm in we try and meet once a month and people go through their ideas or it depends on what stage in the process they're in um, talk about it they may send drafts for people to read and there's also accountability we go through at the end of the meeting and say I'm gonna have this completed by such and such a date and there's a little bit more you know, for people who aren't as self-driven, a little bit more accountability there to help people move along. 
Right. Other? Yeah. Bobby. Uh, we, Bobby Studwell from Charlotte School of Law. We um, did something just a little bit different than everyone else. And one thing that I didn't hear anybody say is one of our faculty members actually has colleagues because she was a practitioner so, so recently that she shopped her, she shipped her articles off to for comment. And that has really helped her in finalizing an article that she finally submitted. But the other thing that we did recently was have a faculty um, meeting or a best practice meeting devoted to scholarship and we had five or six people do 16th baked ideas and actually giving them much shorter time periods to talk about their scholarship, less time for question and answer, and strength in numbers, um, less tim timidity about going and uh, actually presenting an idea, and it helped. Right. Well, and, and um, sort of this idea of, you know, people outside, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll get to later on is that I'm, I'm sort of already incorporating the idea of outside people, but it's not yet implemented in, into what I'm doing. But it's certainly on my mind that it's definitely a, uh, something that's worthwhile. Um, an, another issue that uh, came up is, uh, in, you know, in sort of uh, feeding this idea initially, was a friend of mine who is uh, on a faculty to law school and has yet to actually complete her first article uh, in the process of, of trying to actually get through the process of writing an article she ended up having to, you know, she ended up signing up for a workshop in New York City. So she had to fly from California over a four-day weekend and go through this, uh, you know, this highly, highly organized workshopping uh, progress, which was very beneficial. But again, I wanted to provide something, you know, take advantage of, you know, the online format so that someone doesn't have to get on a plane and fly to New York just to work with other people to develop their ideas. So. Uh, before I get into sort of this front page dashboard sort of view, I wanted to actually sort of go through one of these articles and uh, uh, give a sort of tour of the anatomy of one of these articles. So we're going to use one of the faculty I work with, Michael Gutentag. This, don't worry, I'm not sharing any of their early ideas. These are all, everything I have on this site is something that's already on SSRN. Uh, so this is not the actual raw you know, information that they're using. This is a, a sort of a dummy site for demonstration. But uh, so, you know, if Mike decides he wants to post uh, an article to sort of get feedback from people, then it's very similar to what SSRN looks like. Just the idea being this is something that's earlier than SSRN. But I mean, we've got article title, we've got an abstract, we've got um, a draft that's already been posted on the article. It's available. We've got keywords. Information about when it was posted, when it was updated, information about Mike, his contact information, along with uh, links to other articles uh, that he has on this site. Now, that, that's simple enough, but what's, what's compl more complex about this is that uh, Mike, as the author of this article, has complete control over who actually gets to see this article. So if I am on the site, and he has not selected me as a person that he wants to get feedback from to be able to read the article. When I am on the site, I will not see this article anywhere. It does not exist to me. Um, so you'll see over here this link to manage readers of this article. That will pull up initially a list then of which, member, which users on the site actually have been given permission to read the article. No. No. The only person. Say that again. Okay. No. Okay. The list of who can read it. Yes. Uh, everybody who can read the article can see who else can read the article. Um, so yeah, the very important that that you not you know trash Professor Smith, and then it turns out Smith was actually one of the readers of the article. Um, but the, con the the additional control that uh, that Mike will have is the ability to remove readership, so that a certain person can get taken off. But more commonly, the ability to add people. So this add members tab then gives a list and. 
this interface is, is really raw. I need to work on this to develop it a little bit better. But essentially, add a list of users, click Add Users, and now that person can access the article. So what I'll just do here is just quickly add. So it says one user added to the group. So if I go back to my article, go back to the list of readers, there's now an additional name. So Lauren Willis can now access this article, read it, comment on it. And so then getting back into this whole idea of commenting, something else that makes this a little uh, different from SSRN is that I've turned comments on for this particular article. And so uh, I've got 10 sort of dummy comments here to sh just to show you that uh, the ability for people to post their reactions uh, to the article and also in a threaded fashion so that you can reply directly to an individual comment so that it's not the way most blogs do where it's just this one sort of threadless uh, list, but you can actually drill down and be having discussions, you know, sub-discussions throughout, and, you know, the, the author can then uh, make additional uh, comments uh, to it uh, so to sort of get a conversation going. It's not going to be as interactive as what's happening with, uh, you know, in an actual live workshopping environment, obviously. Uh, maybe people don't necessarily want to uh, be a part of that discussion. Maybe they want to walk down the hallway and tell the, talk to the person in person. Maybe they want to send them an email, pick up a phone, call that person. But they can do all of those things now because they've been given access to the article in the first place. Um, I mean, and even for our uh, live workshopping schedule that we do at Loyola, um, those articles are get distributed as an attachment to an email. Whereas now you have sort of a place to go on this website where that article is. You don't have to sort through your email per se. You know, it, it exists in that in that space. Um, so, you know, the ability to edit one of these articles. You know, so you see, you've basically got these text fields for title, for the abstract, uh, and then a place to upload uh, the draft and you know give it a description so that what they see there, in this case, first draft is what shows up on the page itself rather than sort of a gibberish file name. Um, and then just sort of the ability to do free tagging uh, of subjects. So a lot of this works not that unlike the way, say, a blog website works, you know, that you've got a title, you've got, you know, essentially a body of a page, you may have file attachments, and you've got tags. And that's not surprising because what I'm using as sort of the backbone of this site is a content management system called Drupal, which can be used to develop blogs or any other kind of website. I just happen to have adapted it to this particular need. Um, but apart from, you know, if you take away this, you know, draft uh, file field, you've essentially got something not unlike a typical blog post, title, body, tags, and comments. Yes. You may have addressed this, and I may have missed the sentence. I don't know. But I see first draft. Is it possible for the person to upload a second draft and still keep the first draft on there? Yes. On this, I actually, and I mean, I'll even get really geeky and go in here. And so this is the setup for the article content type. And most of this stuff, if you look at everything from this down, is sort of system stuff that I can really only see because I'm a system administrator and uh, is not really important to the way this thing is set up. But you'll see here is the, uh, this file field. Let me, I can probably boost the text size here so you can see it better. So, you know, the draft field is a file type file. So if I go in here and configure it, I can actually, right now, I'm currently allowed um, one value. But if I go in here and make it so that it has unlimited values and save the field settings, and then go back to where I'm editing this article, now when I refresh this, you'll see that I can add another file. So if I wanted to and I mean, I can even just do this live on the fly here. I'll just pick something that I, if 
I can quickly find a PDF. So I'll upload my boarding pass from yesterday. <laughs> I, up I upload to that site, I get a description field, and I call it second draft. And then a faculty member could say, I really liked your first draft a lot better. Right. It had a lot more content. So now I go and I save that. And obviously I've got a glitch in the program where it's listing both files, both places. But, uh, but apologize for that. But you've got the first draft, which it pulls the the, the, the date that the file was uploaded from the database, so you know, you get a time sense. So the first draft was uploaded September 13th, 2010, and now I've got a second draft that was uploaded on June 23rd, 2011. Yeah. Did you hit the microphone? Uh, hold it down. Hi, I'm Debbie from Chicago. Camp. Are file types limited, or can they upload anything? Could they, they, upload they are limited uh, because I limited them. Uh, the, the file field has the ability to, uh, to, to set specifically what extensions are allowed to be uploaded. And so for this field, I've allowed PDFs, doc, docx, and text. Okay. Um, but if someone wants to upload a WordPerfect file, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll add that in as the allowed. If I want to upload a PowerPoint file, I can change it so that they can upload that. Um, or an audio file, for example. Right. Can commenters upload files? So if they had, let's say, a, an article or some other thing that they wanted to, to share, could they upload files? Uh, if it was set up that way. It's not currently set up that way. Uh, but that's something that can be done within, within the settings of Drupal. It may involve, the way that Drupal works, for those of you who have never used it, it's uh, the, the core software of Drupal, which you install on a server to build this website, comes with uh, some you know, basic functionality, not a whole lot of depth to it. Uh, every every single um, uh, piece of content, which in Drupal terms is called a node, uh, when it out of the box, it comes with a title, a body, and that's it. Uh, but then you have the ability with Drupal to add on these different modules that give it more functionality. Um, so, you know, Content Construction Kit is one module that you add on that allows you to add custom fields. So, without this module installed, and then an extension of that module called file field, you wouldn't be able to attach those files uh, to the article node. Um, there's also one called views, which allows you to do sort of queries of content. So I can set up a, a view that says I want to display all of the articles that have been uploaded uh, to this website and sort them in reverse chronological order with the newest one first. And that creates a query that then gives you a list of all of these, uh, these articles that have been listed. I can then tell it which fields I want listed. So I want to see the, the title. I want to see the author. I want to see the date that it was uploaded. And, and whatever I tell it to, um, it will do. So for something like that where you want to add functionality, sometimes it might be built in. Sometimes it may involve knowing which module you need to add on to Drupal to make that possible. So, like I said, while I don't have it set up so that the comments can include uploaded files, but that could be done. You could add links to uh, external files if you wanted to. Um, but it's just a question of what you want to make possible on your site. And Chris, did you have a question? Well, I'm just wondering, um, if you just converted our website. Hit the, mic, hit the mic. I was wondering, we just converted our website to Drupal, and I'm wondering if you have somewhere a list of the different modules and, and things that you've used to create this. Um, well, I will, I will use that then to talk about, uh, before I get to a full list, to talk about the most important module beyond these first two, the, the, the content construction kit and views, is something called organic groups, um, which in Drupal, organic groups was created to basically create these sort of groups within a website so that you have um, you know, this, this spot on your website for uh, certain people who are members of this group who, and only they can see and contribute to this particular group. Um, so you know, typically, the idea of this, at least initially, was that it would be used for more like group settings. So say, you know, within your website, you wanted to have an intranet uh, piece that's cordoned off for, say, just the librarians. 
where they would be able to upload content. They would, you know, they have information that's just for the librarian's eyes. Organic groups should be able to create a group for the librarians. I've actually taken this uh, module and adapted it so that those article nodes, the article content in, in the site, are also organic groups. And so um, this, this whole infrastructure, which allows me to uh, manage who can see a particular article, is I see the organic group's configuration. And I'll use content types here. I've set, up, I've set it up so that articles are what's called group nodes, which means that the article itself is a group. Um, so while we see it on the site as just an article, that article itself is a group, and the people who are readers are members of that group. And so then only those people can see that content on the site because only those people are members of the group. Something interesting is that, say, um, you are co-authoring an article with multiple authors. Um, rather than just because uh, any piece of content in Drupal can only have one author by default. Um, but I don't have to necessarily display the author of the node to display as the author. Because within organic groups, a group can have multiple administrators. And so, you know, say I'm co-authoring an article with Bobby, then uh, I created the node, but then I can go into it where it has that manage readers. Um, and so you see that Mike here is the admin for this group but he can make Doug an admin as well. And so now you'll see that next to Doug's name, it says admin as well. And um, so then I could actually make it so that where it displays the author information in the sidebar, that it's not pulling from the author of the node. It's pulling from the admins of the group. And so then any of those authors will be displayed as an author and any of them will also have the ability to decide who gets to, um, to read the article and can make changes, upload drafts, that sort of thing. So it's not just restricted to that one author. You can have multiple people. In addition to that, uh, something people can do is those, those live in-person workshopping events are actually uh, you know, coordinated by a staff member. Um, and so it's, con it's conceivable then that, say, a uh, particular um, faculty member uh, is going to be doing a live workshop, well then they can also make Bridget, the coordinator, an admin as well, and through putting a filter in the view that displays the information about the authors, just say that if Bridget is one of the people who's an admin, don't list her. So then no one sees uh, the coordinator of the program as an author on these articles, but yet she will still have the ability to go in and upload drafts and things like that as needed. Um, and incorporating those live events is something that uh, is planned for the site. And so, actually, stay here. So you'll see up here at the top we have this uh, event link in the menu. And so right now the only we have one upcoming event listed uh, for a week from today. And if you go, if you click on for that event, you're actually going to that same article node. But you'll see that it's got this workshop alert over in the sidebar that tells you, hey, there's an upcoming event for this particular article. So if you, you know, here's where it is, what time it is, and if you want to go, you need to RSVP for it. And the way that I have this set up right now, and I'll get to an, an alternate way this could be done, is there's actually uh, a, some separate fields within the article. So if I go back to where I'm an admin on the site, and I go to that same event, you'll see I now have this edit tab up at the top where I didn't have it over here where I'm not an admin for this group, so I have no privileges uh, to edit the article. 
But here, so if I go into edit on this, because I'm a site administrator, the permissions are set up so that I now have access to additional fields. And this is something where we would give Bridget, who coordinates the scheduling, access to these fields, these individual fields, so that she can set up a workshop date and time as well as a location. And when that content exists for one of these articles and the date that's listed there is either equal to or greater than today's date, then you'll automatically have this alert show up at the, uh, on the article page. So that's why that's being displayed there is because we've set the site up so that if there's a value there and it's greater than or equal to today's date, bam, it gets displayed. Once it's, you know, once, uh, once we get to Friday, July 1st, that workshop alert will no longer display on this page because it's a past event. Um, another way that that can be done within Drupal, because it's a situation where you might have someone do a workshopping event for the same article multiple times. And uh, we could do that by allowing it to have multiple date and location fields, um, although that gets complicated and confusing the system because those fields aren't connected in any way, and so it doesn't know which date goes with which location. Or you can have what's called a node reference, sort of getting into the Drupalese way of talking about this. Um, an individual type of node, a piece of content in Drupal, you can set up a custom field that makes reference to another node, another piece of content. And so I can set up an event content type that has a field in it for date, a field in it for location, and a field in it for node reference, which is allowed to reference articles. And so then I can go through there, select which article I want that event to, uh, to make reference to. And so now when I just, and it, you can still make the same connections, though, so that because that event is connected to this article, it will all be connected. We can have links to the article. We can do all the same things, but that will then allow us to have multiple events for the same article and archive those so that you can still go back and see the information about the old event and know that it existed and where it was for whatever reason, as opposed to the current setup where I would need to replace the old workshop event information with the new in order to have a second event. Does that make sense? One thing. Yes. Um, sorry, I forgot to raise my hand. That was part of the condition was I had to raise my hand. Um, but presumably then um, all of this can then be exported out into the general faculty calendar that you have. Yeah. Um, I mean, at, at, at this point, because everything is, is still wrapped up really tightly within these organic groups, uh, there's visibility issues so that unless... Um, I make everybody uh, a reader of this article, or I forgot to mention this, when we're doing one that has an event attached to it, and th th this is another field that is not visible uh, to the actual author of the article themselves because I don't have the administrative rights to do this for the site, but you'll see here this field that says private group. Let me... Uh, And so the question is, says, should this group be visible only to its members, visible if the group is set to list and directory or membership requests open? So basically, we can set it up where, and this is currently unchecked, because now that this is an event, it needs to be visible to the entire faculty, because the only people who can actually access this material are our faculty at this point. So if something is openly available to everyone, that just means openly available to our faculty. Um, but by unchecking private group, that gets rid of that whole readers aspect of things. And now anyone on the site can access this article. And so once this becomes uh, an open group, then it's open to anybody and it could be displayed on a general calendar. I mean, one of the interesting things that uh, I was able to do by setting it up where there isn't a separate event type is that um, for this events list, I've set up a view that queries uh, the, the existing content in the database. And it's still, it's the same exact kind of view as my articles view, which just displays all the newest articles on the site. 
But the events one also has a condition in it that says, okay, in addition to being an article, it also has to have a value in that date field. And that value needs to be greater than or equal to now. And so this upcoming events thing is still just listing articles that are on the site the same as any other view on the site does, but with that additional condition that suddenly makes it sort of a calendar type of view as opposed to just a list of what's on the site. Um, you can also, in addition to pulling up, you know, these articles, both, and I haven't really shown these different pages yet, but so I've got an articles list, which is nothing more than a list of the newest articles in reverse chronological order. That list will only display the articles that you have access to. So there may be 50 more articles on that uh, on this site, but if you if you, if you've only been granted readership to three articles, your list of newest articles will only be three articles long. If you've been granted readership to 10, it'll be 10 long. It's strictly controlled by what you have access to. So if Mike has not allowed me to read something, I can't even see that it exists. But I can also display these articles by faculty members. So, uh, you know, I've just got sort of a rudimentary directory here of who is on the site at this point because this is still very early in, in the testing phase. So um, if I go to Mike's profile and display him, in addition to his basic contact information and a photo of him, it also lists which articles he's posted to the site. And basically what this is, this list is a list of all of the groups that he is an admin for. If Mike is an administrator for a particular organic group, it shows up in this table as one of his articles. And so then I can go pull up a different one of his articles, read the abstract, download a draft, and again, have access then to that list of other articles uh, that he's written from the article page itself. And then I've also set up sort of a dashboard view on the front page, and I'll go to Mike's view of the site, so there's more content. And so uh, when, you, when they log in and go to the front page, they basically just get a quick view of what the most recent articles that have been posted are. And since this is a, meant to encourage discussion, also a list of the most recent comments that have been posted to various articles, you know, saying who posted it, when they posted it, what article they're posting it, they posted a comment to as well. And then also a list of any upcoming events that are coming up. But since this is also a site where people, where the users themselves are uploading content, they want to keep up to date on their own content, probably as much if not more so than the other people's content. There's also these lists of their own articles, what they've posted to the site, as well as the most recent comments that other people have made to their articles. So, you know, to, to, so that I log in, I can immediately see if I've got a new comment. Um, and there's also, it's also set up so But my permissions must not be right, so let me go back to this one. Also set up so that any time, so I, I post a comment to this particular article, I can also set it up so that I get notified by email whenever there's a new comment posted here. And by default, we would have it set up so that for any article that Pam posts on the site, Unless she turns it off, she's going to get an email every time that someone uh, posts a comment to one of her articles so that she doesn't have to be going in every day or every hour and clicking refresh to see if something new is there. And again, that's something that's very much sort of blog functionality that's been adapted uh, into uh, this site. Now, okay, go ahead. Tom, Tom sorry, one question. Uh, is that customizable so that you can either just... Do you just get a um, notification there is a new comment, or do you get the text of the comment, or can you can you set that whenever you receive the email notification? Um, so the settings for what's called comment notify is the is the module. Uh, I can, I, can, I, as, I as an administrator can set up what content types actually are eligible for notifications, so that I could just turn them off for articles for the whole site for everyone. Uh, but then, let's see here. I can also go in and set up uh, unsubscribing people. So 
So the, the default mail text for sending out notifications to node authors. So the, you've, so Pam has posted an article, and another faculty member has posted a comment to Pam's article. Uh, the email that comes out says, hi, Pam, you have received a comment on, and then it'll have the name of your article. Uh, you can view the comment at the following URL, has a link to it, and so it gives you a link to view it. Um, you, but there's also, yeah, th there are variables that can put in there, so I could put in the comment text as a variable and change that, that email so that it actually sends you an email that has the actual body of that particular comment, rather than just a link that goes, uh, that you have to click on to go to the site. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, the only thing in terms of sort of the techie aspect of this that I'll talk about is that um, because I'm sort of bending this group structure into something you don't think of as group and, and because the group functionality comes with all of this group terminology that I don't want to display all this information about you know, subscribing to group and I don't want to display a whole lot about you know, that you are a member of this group as opposed to a reader of this group. I did have to do some customization to the code uh, in order to make it look more like what I wanted it to look like as opposed to the, the default group uh, text. So that has to do uh, organic groups come with a description field and I suppose that that description field could be used for the abstract uh, would kill two birds with one stone but those that description field gets hard coded into, into so many places on the site that I don't want to display it um, that I replaced it with just a text field for the abstract and so basically what I what I had to do was get rid of uh, the description field and so I said that you know that, that Drupal is built on these modules that have functionality, and so I have a custom module that houses all of my custom code. And so one of the things that I did is, of course, that doesn't work. Well, I was hoping to zoom in and make this bigger, but it doesn't seem to want to. Uh, but Using the, the, the code the way that Drupal understands code, and I just realized I didn't talk about my list of modules that uh, I was asked about, but I will get to that in a second. But um, basically, you know, this function, and Drupal works on what's called these hooks, that there are certain hooks within uh, Drupal that tell it when to use a particular function. So I have... Up the top here, this one is called function workshop underscore form underscore alter. Form alter is a hook that Drupal recognizes throughout the entire system so that uh, you can make changes to the forms that are hard-coded within Drupal. And rather than going in and editing that hard-coded uh, programming code, which then every time I updated my core programming from the Drupal website, when there's a new update to the site, it would wipe out all of my changes if I was editing the the actual core or contributed uh, content. And when I say contributed, I mean the, the add-on modules and the add-on themes that are available. Um, so I can have my own separate look warehouse for my code and my functions, which is this custom module. And so form alter, there are modules all over Drupal that have form alter functions that every time Drupal uh, populates a form or displays a form on the site, it's looking at all of these form alter functions all over to see if the conditions match something in one of these pieces of code. The workshop part, that's just the name of my module. So my function is called workshop, form alter. Workshop, the name of the module, form alter is the hook. And then I have case, article node form. So every time the article node form, which is both for editing existing articles and for adding new articles, Every time that, fo that form uh, is pulled up, then these lines of code are loaded into Drupal. So what I've done then is I have two that have something that says OG underscore description. And what I'm doing is I'm changing values within that form behind the scenes. So rather, the way it comes up is the form has default text. And it, it's also, uh, or the, the form is displayed and the form is required. You, by default, you can't create a group without giving it a description. Well, I don't want to do that. So 
I've changed the value of the required attribute to zero, which in computer lingo, zero is off, one is on. So I've changed it to zero, it's no longer required. It can be empty. And I've also changed it so that the type is now hidden, so you don't see it. So to get it, you know, just to briefly get into sort of the internals of how this stuff works, with those two lines of code, I've completely wiped out the description field for, for the articles, uh, but have not touched the module itself. Whenever there's an update to the organic groups module that the creator of that does, I can make all those updates, but my, my changes to it still work. Um, so that's really, this down here is just lines of code that change how the user profiles display. Because by default, it comes with this list of every group they're a member of. It tells how long they've been a member of the site. I don't need all that, so I'm just unsetting the values for a whole lot of variables there just to make those changes. But those are just, those are changes that I've made to match my preferences, and I have the ability to go in and fine tune those. But by default, by doing this, you know, the functionality to be able to control who sees an article and to create these articles and add fields to them, those don't require any coding whatsoever. Those are already built into there. And if you want to get more control over how things look or what's there, you can get into the coding. But that's something you sort of work up to. It took me probably four years of working with Drupal before I ever touched one piece of code. And I was perfectly happy before that. So, uh, any questions? beyond what we've already talked about. And module list. Um, all that I'll really say about that at this point is that, I mean, in a, I can show you a list of every module that I have installed on the site. Um, but it's going to be tedious and not really explain anything. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know, once you install, once you drop a module folder into your server, it shows up here, and it's just a matter of checking it or unchecking it. Um, and did you, you started with Acquia Drupal? Yes. So, okay. um, right. So, and then with what Pam just asked about was, was the, 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 the distribution of Drupal that I use. Drupal Core comes with, like I said, just really basic functionality. Um, it comes with a content type that has a title and um, uh, a body field, and that's it. And I don't have the ability to run these queries to display all this different content, all these different comments. And so I have to install all of these different modules. There are other distributions of Drupal beyond just what you get from the website drupal.org. The one that I typically use is Acquia Drupal, um, A-C-Q-U-I-A. And Acquia is useful mainly because it already comes with a lot of really commonly used modules pre-installed. So content construction kit for custom fields, views for those queries is already part of Drupal when you install it from that Acquia distribution. Um, there are other things, you know, there's things like something called Five Star that gives you the ability to have people rate uh, particular nodes. So the, the, the Cali Conference website is built with Drupal as well. They use five-star module so that for all the session pages, there's a little thing there with five stars where you can rate the individual sessions. That's how they make that possible, just by turning on that module, telling it to attach it to the session nodes, and then everybody can rate those, and it automatically gives uh, a score for all the different um, uh, sessions. As far as learning more, if, if this is something, I mean, I, I'm not so much trying to push Drupal on this as sort of just push this idea of using these intranets or internets to, um, did I just say internets? Um, to, to, to use the internet as sort of this nonlinear way of doing something that everyone has always been doing in person which doesn't necessarily replicate in the same way, but it allows more people to be involved and uh, to give them the ability to have access to more materials than they would just by going to these weekly um, lunch sessions. Um, and I feel like I'm missing something else. Um, I asked you this before, and so I know your answer to this, that you haven't done this yet, but I'll expand upon it. 
one of the things that I think would be a great expansion upon this is the ability to do like red line editing in, um, or actual commenting within the document itself. Right. And I don't know if you know if there's any way to anything that already exists that might be able to, you might be able to like drop in a module to do that or something. Not off the top of my head. I mean, particularly when you're talking about attached documents. I mean, the, the, the most basic yet not necessarily user-friendly way to do that would be as if people are uploading Word document versions of their uh, articles as opposed to PDFs of their articles. And then if you, know, you have the uh, track changes turned on, then they would be able to go through and be crossing out things and adding things and making changes that they could then send back, maybe or post as an attachment to the comment uh, with their recommended changes. Although that probably would be more commonly used or necessary when you're talking about you know, two co-authors collaborating together, which isn't necessarily what this is intending to, um, to enhance. Uh, but within Drupal, off the top of my head, I don't know whether that's possible. Um, I don't think that with the attached files like that, that would really be something that Drupal would be responsible for so much as whatever software reads the files. Um, and uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned here that I talked, I mentioned very briefly when Bobby was talking about wanting to share with people externally is that at this point, this is still strictly in-house. Um, and also, if you uncheck that private groups box, then that means that anybody on the site can access it. Uh, so if we started adding in external people, I mean, one of the things I wanted to be able to do with this site at some point is say Mike wants to have someone uh, from Georgia State access this article within the same site and be contributing comments within, you know, in the same interaction with the people from Loyola who have, who have access. Um, that's something that uh, really this site at this point doesn't care what law school you're from, so we could just add another user to the site and allow them uh, to, and make them a reader of a particular article. Uh, but we would need to add in some more functionality to the private groups checkbox, something other than that so that they aren't also being let in and the ability to comment on something just because it's being workshopped at Loyola. We'd still want to be able to restrict that just to our faculty, and that's not built into the site yet. Um, that might be a, a, one thing that I would like to be able to do and I'm not a jQuery programmer, so this is not necessarily going to happen anytime soon, is that in that, that form where I can add users, what I'd like to be able to do is have that box, that giant box, hidden so that no one sees that. And what you actually get when you say add readers is this overlay that pops up that has anyone ever created a group in Facebook? Not, not, not a group, but a, but a group of friends where you go in and create uh, from your list of friends you create sort of a subgrouping of friends. To do that, you get this overlay of a grid of the face and the name of all these different people that you're friends with, and you just go through and check off the ones that you want. You hit submit. They're now in that group. That's what I want to do with this, but it's, I'm going to have to beef up my jQuery skills before I can pull that off. Um, but I would also like the functionality so that uh, before you even get to the individual people, that I will just have a list of all of the schools that have faculty uh, within uh, the site and say I want to only limit it to Loyola. I want to make every Loyola faculty member be able to access this. All I got to do is just check off Loyola Law School and bam, they're now readers of the article. And if I go in and uncheck it, it wipes out every, every single one of them. Uh, and I mean, ideally, I think this is something that could be useful for all law schools having one central site to do this. Uh, because then I could go through and pick out a different professor from a different school and not have to limit it just to Loyola. Now, whether or not this is ever going to expand beyond Loyola, I have no idea. Um, it's limited by, in addition to my employer's permission, my time and my ability, and both of those aren't quite at the level that, to make that happen yet. Sorry, just had a brain thing. Um, couldn't this also be expanded to law journals, to, to law reviews, especially whenever they're going through the note process? Sure, why not? I mean, it's, um, you, might, you might not want them mingling. The same sort of thing. Yeah, you might not want them mingling with the, with the faculty system, but. Yeah, set up a different instance. Of yeah, it could either be a, di a different instance, or once I figure out how the best way to set up these sort of subgroups for different schools goes, well, then maybe I just have a subgroup within the site 
uh, for law review members, and they never see anything that has anything to do with the faculty at all. It's all the same site, all together in one place, but they're seeing completely different content just because they belong to different uh, populations. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I hope that I uh, had something useful to say for you.